from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our final speaker before break is Jeff Haynes Stiles, who has worked on Innovative Science Media Project since 1978 when he was series director and senior producer for Carl Sagan's landmark and Emmy-winning Cosmos series. He's here today to talk about the crowd and the cloud and how citizen science has revolutionized scientific data. Science by, for, and with the people, how citizen science and mobile tech have revolutionized the collection, sharing, and use of scientific data. Jeff, take it away. I was going to say, and now for something completely different, but every single talk has been completely different, so I won't say, and now for something completely different. But thanks to the Library of Congress for inviting us all along today, and I've got some references from what we saw yesterday that actually tie into some of the themes of this talk. Um, I've been a science producer since 1980. It's taken me to the ends of the Earth, which is fortunate because in the Antarctic they give you helmets that cover your ball spots, so everything is good. I'm here to do it today to talk about the crowd and the cloud. My collaborators on that project are Walid Abdullahi, former NASA chief scientist. You'll see him in a video clip in a moment. And my collaborator in life and work, Erna Kugano, who's in the front uh, there. Thank you, Erna. Recent uh, grandmother, uh, congratulations. And See, the Library of Congress congratulates you as well. Isn't this great? Um, so um, as was said, I've had a great time working with some of the most celebrated scientists in the, in the country and also comedians like Lily Tomlin. What I hadn't been aware of until I was walking around yesterday is that the Library of Congress actually has a great collection of Alan Lomax memorabilia. I worked with him on a series called American Patchwork about uh, roots music. The Crowd in the Cloud, funded by the National Science Foundation, is designed to increase the visibility, credibility, and participation in citizen science. Now, how many people in the audience could define citizen science at a cocktail party? That's uh, about five or six people out of a couple of hundred. So that's one of the reasons that we decided that we should try and do this series. Citizen science is definitely a coming trend. You'll hear from some of the citizen scientists them yourselves. These are some of the words that have been used to define citizen science over the uh, past few years. You'll see cyber is in a lot of them. A lot of them have natural uh, history environments uh, as part of the, the subject matter. One of my favorite uh, ones is Nerds for Nature, um, and there's actually a citizen science project called Nerds for Nature. Um, another way of saying that, however, would be science for, by, by, for, and with the people that you may notice comes from the Gettysburg Address, and again, Lincoln is a great presence in the Library of Congress, so I was pleased to find that out yesterday. We've created four one-hour programs that debuted on public television this last spring. I'm going to show you a large number of video clips, which accounts for me trying to talk rather fast. Crowdandcloud.org is where you can find all the programs streaming in real time if what we show you is of interest. Uh, our premise is to try and turn viewers into doers, not just to have a good time watching a TV show, but actually to be uh, encouraged to become part of the citizen science movement. And it wouldn't be possible without collaboration with a number of government agencies and NGOs and citizen science projects. So, this is how we begin the series, and this is how we begin this presentation. The Crowd and the Cloud is made possible by NSF, the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. This is today's citizen science. Level seven. People pursuing their passions and at the same time generating data that's useful for research. I love surfing, I love science, and I get to go surfing for science. <laughs> Technology is a way to really get people outside and to look more carefully at the natural world. There are now more mobile phones on Earth than people on our planet, and new technologies can help solve major challenges. Every single data point has a human story. Now communities can use science to tackle local problems. The state doesn't come out and say, you gotta clean this up. So we started on the Bucket Brigade. They're linking sensors and citizens to find solutions. I'm learning about toxins. I'm learning how to teach other people to do what I do so they can do it for themselves. Asthma is a lonely disease. The propeller sensors are going to revolutionize the asthma treatment. Collaborating via the cloud, the crowd can save time, save money, and save lives. We're surely smarter together. I'm Walid Abdullahi, host of The Crowd in the Cloud. 
I've studied Earth's ice sheets from satellites and aircraft, and I was NASA chief scientist at the time when Curiosity landed on Mars. So I know big data and big science. But I'm also convinced that citizen-generated data has an important role. No longer is science something only done by professionals in labs. No more is data just the property of corporations and government. For years, you've watched science on public television. Now, you're invited to do science. Well, I hope you can see we've got a wide variety of projects that we feature in the series and a wide variety of folks who are involved. Citizen science actually has a long history. The background here is Thomas Jefferson's weather records dating back to the 1770s. And today's citizen scientists looking at weather, 20,000 observers are recording daily precipitation measurements, including one, at least it was there, on the left-hand side, a rain gauge in Michelle Obama's uh, vegetable garden. So these are contributing data that the National Weather Service uses to update flash flood warnings. Uh, history, uh, of uh, the Christmas bird count goes back to 1900. It's one of the longest running citizen science projects in the United States. But contemporary citizen science also includes the maker movement, millennials, folks like the people that are part of Public Lab. And this is a gratuitous shot just because it makes me think of Arcade Fire on tour, but these are actually citizen scientists flying balloons underneath kites to document the BP oil spill off the Deepwater Horizon. Contemporary citizen science also includes putting sensors, microscopic fence sensors on surfboard fins to look at ocean acidification and sea surface temperature. So as we said, a great variety. Um, trying to tie my presentation to the themes of this conference, I'm going to talk about three different kinds of data collection and sharing. In some cases, it's a, it's a question of data that's putting communities on the map and helping to solve problems. And that's what this next little clip is about, the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. It was founded to truck, look at truck routes going through West Oakland and how truck routes were corresponding to asthma attacks in senior citizen centers and daycare centers. They managed to get the truck routes that you saw in red replaced by the truck routes in green by going out and counting trucks, not counting birds, counting trucks and then going to city government to get them to move uh, the truck routes away from the, the most heavily populated areas. They've continued their work reaching out to kids, trying to get kids excited about the new generation of sensors. And this next little clip shows how excited the teens, like in the project that Tom and Patrick showed you, get when they're doing authentic research. In this case, it's not an archive. They're using their environment, their community, as the source of data. When the students have been able to go out and walk around the community, and collect data and then observe things. They understand the correlation between the data and the sources of the pollution that they're interested in. This is called the dust tracker. It measures how much dust and particulate matter there is in the air. Particular matter is the little dust particles that we can't see. The more cars pass by, the more particulate matter there is, and the less cars that pass by, the less there are. So the air filter in there, there's a cartridge. We could send that out and test particulates. And they found that it's different kinds of metals. And most of those things are from the brakes, from the wheels, and from the tracks. So if you think about metal, you're bringing in bits of metal. It's like the, um, the police officers that have to be down here all the time, like the security guards. Yeah, like, yeah. Because of the low-cost sensors available in the smartphones or other devices, the students can collect data and immediately begin interpreting them. In December 2015, some of the students presented their findings at the American Geophysical Union, which is one of the largest and busiest gatherings of professional Earth and space scientists. I mean, coming to AGU, like, that's, that's amazing. Like, I didn't really realize how big of a deal it was until I started looking into it. We have something to bring to the table, too, just us high school students, and people want to hear what mm -hmm. we have to say. Yeah. And, it's kind of exciting. Yeah. Like, you know, what I'm doing like, really matters. It does matter. Yeah. It does matter. It gives us hope. Like, we're, we might change something, you know, make a change to BART. We sometimes frighten the statisticians because they would prefer to have a little bit of perfectly pristine, absolutely, you know, 100% data from a million dollar machine. And we're saying, no, no, let's take this, you know, $200 machine and start making decisions based on it. 
But the notion is that if you had, you know, one million dollar machine, you can do so much with that. But if you have a million hundred dollar machines, all spewing data into the cloud, turning it back to us as in a direct feedback loop, then we start to adjust behavior immediately. So the second category of citizen science I'm going to talk about is where there is no data, where there seem to be no agencies that are involved in gathering the data, as you might expect, and sharing that. This is an example from the second program, which is called Citizens Plus Scientists, of where a concerned citizen, Deb, you'll, you'll see her in the, in the piece, but because it's an edited segment, it doesn't have the name supers, that's why the names are here at the beginning, was concerned about air pollution in her area, resulting from oil and gas development. She went to an NGO, Denny Larson's Bucket Brigade, captured data, and you'll see a little bit about how data is captured, and then shared that through the peer review process with a big result in terms of state policy. So it goes all the way from data collection to social good, socially uh, beneficial results. It took uh, right at 100 double semi loads to get the rig in. It was a triple rig. You know, the traffic went from maybe three or four cars a week to like 50 a day. Tons of dust on this county road. They'd flare for months. They'd light the, the flare and the whole creek bottom would shake. And so our house would just shake. Lots of noise. All the wildlife just took off. There were spills and leaks and nobody cleans it up. Nobody says anything or does anything. There's no oversight. The state doesn't come out and say, you got to clean this up. It's left to the people who are living there. The first thing that happens is the sites are selected. The citizen scientists are trained on site by ourselves. They've got a set number of samples that they can take. So the samples are taken, um, literally taking you know, a plastic bucket and putting some stainless steel on it that will hold the sample bag. It's like a lung, so the bucket is the body, the bag is the lung, and then there's a pump which serves as your diaphragm, which pumps the air out, creating negative pressure, opening the bag and bringing in air so it can be sealed and sent to the lab for testing. And they uh, process it immediately. Bucket Brigade techniques have been reviewed by the EPA and have been found to be useful in capturing data where government sensors are lacking. I was shocked. I didn't think we'd find much. And we found emissions off the freaking charts. We found that many of the samples exceeded those standards. Some for benzene were something like 10,000 times above the standard. Many of the toxic chemicals that are known to cause cancer that we found in this report were uh, in some cases hundreds, in other cases thousands, and in one case 22 million times over the EPA cancer risk. These are enormous releases. Many of these compounds are neurotoxins. At high concentrations, they can actually cause coma, but at lower concentrations, they tend to reduce brain function. The long-term effects, the biggest one is cancer because several of these are known human carcinogens. So when we started doing the Bucket Brigade, this five, six state Bucket Brigade, we didn't intend on doing the peer-reviewed article. We were just gonna do the report. I became involved in the fracking study when the groups that had coordinated the community-based activities approached me for assistance doing the statistical analysis of the data, writing up the publication, and getting it published in a peer-reviewed journal. And whenever there is this kind of study, Having a peer-reviewed publication is sort of the good housekeeping seal of legitimacy for a, a study. What happens with citizen science is everybody disses it. So the peer-reviewed article was extremely important because it gave validity to citizen science. I think that's why we got taken so seriously that a journal article had been published, and this is what academics, scientists, and doctors were saying about the extreme hazard from oil and gas development. And there was widespread coverage across the U.S. and actually globally of both the peer-reviewed study and the report, and it, it had a major impact. I think the greatest influence from the warning signs report was for the ban in New York. Our fracking study 
was waived by the Commissioner of Health when he made the announcement that, that the governor of New York was banning fracking. So the, the last genre of citizen science I'm going to talk about is really more like crowdsourcing. And this is where there's so much data, rather than the lack of data in the case of fracking or the public lab work with BP, uh, 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 the horizon, Deepwater Horizon, there is so much data coming out of a research lab that you can crowdsource it much faster than the uh, work could be done by re researchers themselves. So this story is about uh, the folks up at Cornell who are looking to see if they can figure out the causes of Alzheimer's. Uh, they think it's reduced blood flow in the brain, they experiment on mice, they take videos of mouse brains, and they then have the problem that uh, it takes them a week to capture the data, but a year to analyze it. So they've turned to the crowd. They've borrowed from or adapted examples from successful gamified citizen science projects, including the NASA Stardust mission, where 30,000 uh, people playing a game were essentially able to find traces of uh, interstellar particles, and eyewire, eye which is looking at neurons in the brain. Putting this together, they were able to borrow from, t uh, from all of the lessons of, of web games in terms of uh, having leaderboards, competition, fighting to have your name up there at the top of the leaderboard. And this is how a citizen science project was demoed in a retirement community in Florida playing the stall catchers game. You can see the excitement that these senior citizens got from trying to help speed up Alzheimer's research. In late 2016, Eyes on Owls released its stall catchers game based on the Stardust interface. The public was invited to help crowdsource the analysis of blocked blood vessels. Some of the first players were in central Florida. They were retirees who'd chosen the warm climate and a community with plenty to do. How many of you have family, friends, somebody close to you that either has or did have Alzheimer's, or you have it? Just about everybody, huh? If only the scientists work on it, it might take as much as 30 years. And for most of us, it's not going to be a big benefit. This is what the game looks like. And you can get it on your phone, your tablet, your laptop. Does the game change every day? Yes, yes, they keep okay. going. They keep putting okay. you through. They've taken off. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How many think that it's flowing? How many think it's stalled? Shall we find out? Yes. We'll try stalled then. Okay? Correct. <laughs> and I got 402 points. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we go. We're climbing. We're climbing. Every time we find a stalled one that is really stalled, we are helping big time. One of the things I like about the, this research is that we can help my mother's generation, but I'm 64, and you know, while I want to help my mom, this is going to help, I call, kids my age. Eyes on Owls will keep on refining its gameplay interface, but its greatest impact on Alzheimer's research will come from the limitless power of the crowd. One of the common questions about citizen science is, is the data quality reliable enough? And the folks behind the Eyes on Owls project worked on that, and they have been able to find that relative to laboratory-grade research, the crowd is doing very well. Originally, they thought they would have to have 20 members of the crowd to validate each result. They've now gone down to seven to eight people looking at each piece of data to get quality results. So data quality is often raised about citizen science. The quality of many citizen science projects has been demonstrated in statistics that I think any of you would find convincing. Well, our series was on the air back in April and May, and PBS stations will be rerunning it uh, on into the next couple of years. But just last weekend, we did a global catch-a-thon modeled on the sort of open street map mapathons in which you give people pizza, have them get together to do a mapping of streets. This time, Eyes on Owls coordinated a global effort, 22 teams in six different continents, on six different continents, playing a game within an hour to see who could 
actually code the, the largest number of stalls. And you can see some of the people there, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, Chile, uh, China, Brazil, all around the world, people were online playing this game, and we did a, a live Zoom hangout to document that. The winners were actually down in Chile. You can see that they annotated 1,955 examples of brain science, and then they celebrated, and everybody got to share in that. Citizen science has, in fact, become a global phenomenon, with uh, citizen science associations in Australia uh, and also in Europe being very strong. Some of the apps developed in Spain are actually now being used here in the United States as well. Uh, this is called Mosquito Alert, with the concern about Zika. Anything that citizens can do to report the areas in which there is a, a breeding site for mosquitoes is very important. Um, this little video just shows you that these are the sites of traditional locations of live traps, but this, they're fairly limited. This is the number of citizen science reports that came in in Spain. So my time is up. Coffee break is uh, looming. I'm going to just zip over the next few things just to say that there is an NSF project using uh, $6 microscopes to attach to the smartphones that are also part of today's citizen science revolution. And that I'm skipping over that and ending here by saying that it's a revolution that is happening. It's powered by people. It is really answering concerns that communities and citizens have, but it's using the tools of science. It's generating data from the, from the environment, analyzing it, collaborating with scientists, and then delivering back solutions that work. So citizens plus sensors working for solutions. That's a pretty good summary of what today's citizen science is. And Erna and I would be happy to talk to anybody over the break about any of the things we've just said. So thanks very much, Library of Congress, for putting this on. Delighted to be here. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.